Hi guys, and welcome back to another edition of the True Crime Show with myself, Kevin Moore. Now, this features the most shocking killers in true crime history and the authors that have written about them. Now, on today's show, I'm about to be joined with my guest, John Ferrick. Now, John has previously spent five years with the Wisconsin Investigation Team for USA Today Network and nine years in Nebraska at the World Herald newspaper. Now, he is an authority on wrongful arrest and conviction cases, and he joins me today to discuss his latest book, A Racking Crew, Demolishing the Case Against Stephen Avery. Now, I just want to say here that the Stephen Avery and Brandon Dassey case is a, a large case, and uh, to really give the subject matter a fair interview, I really need to sort of spend many weeks researching this interview but i'm i'm making my own true crime docuseries right now with mark richards so um i've been able to do some research on this case and i will just let my my guest john do a lot of the uh, talking right now so let me just welcome my guest on so john ferrick welcome to the show Glad to be here. Uh, John, uh, this is going to be a, a, a really fascinating interview, I hope, for so many people that are going to watch this as well. And I know you've done numerous interviews um, on this particular um, uh, book as well, your latest book, uh, Wrecking Crew. Um, but j first of all, um, for those who may not know what the Wrecking Crew is about, uh, just give us a brief uh, synopsis of that, please. Wrecking Crew really is about the uh, the Stephen Avery case, the case that became famous uh, through uh, the two different episodes of Making a Murderer, which became a huge, you know, fascinating hit, uh, just blew everything away on, on Netflix. So it's the story of Stephen Avery, man from Wisconsin who's been uh, convicted, uh, uh, wrongfully convicted, lost 18 years of his life in prison for, for a sexual assault he didn't commit. And then while he's waiting to uh, um, get a $36 million settlement, from the police that had framed him the first time around, lo and behold, he gets arrested for a, a murder that happened uh, um, near his uh, near his property in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And obviously, how did you get into this particular story? Because obviously, you've done previous uh, true crime books before. What drew you Correct. to this one? Well, this one uh, it, this one was interesting because it was kind of time and place. I happened to be back in the state of Wisconsin, Kevin, um, while the Making a Murderer series uh, hit uh, the airwaves in December of 2015. So I was a journalist for the USA Today, their investigative team based in Wisconsin. And since the Stephen Avery case uh, was a huge Wisconsin case and crime, and everybody was enthralled by it and really wanted to know what happened, I drew the assignment to uh, do a lot of investigative journalism after Making a Murderer came out, really uh, to dig into the case, to try to get to the truth of the matter. Um, and uh, and then all these stories that I did really led me to the point where I, I felt that uh, that I had enough material to put together a book that really had never been done before. There had been a couple of books that were really, you know, anti-Steve Avery, that were really of the opinion that, hey, you know, this bastard needs to fry in prison. You know, the police don't make mistakes. Prosecutors are always right. So there was a few of those kind of books that had already been produced, but there really hadn't been anything uh, done in the state of Wisconsin that really took a look at the case from a very, from a very critical eye, Kevin, and really, uh, you know, dissected the evidence to uh, really give people an honest perspective. Um, I, I didn't have a dog in the fight, you know. I wasn't a prosecutor. I wasn't a defense attorney. wasn't a family member. wasn't related to the victim. So I was there as an honest neutral observer as a reporter and basically put this book together to let the public uh, decide for their for themselves you know what really the truth about Stephen Avery's uh, conviction your background is in the is in the print background um, but you trained as a journalist did you yes that's that's correct Kevin I worked uh, I have about 25 years now in the field as a journalist the last three years I've done exclusively as an online as a digital journalist uh, here in the United States, but uh, I had uh, over 20 years uh, as a print journalist in several states in the United States. And had you heard of the case prior to the Netflix documentary? I had, and it's interesting because I lived in Wisconsin uh, from 2000 through 2003. So actually, I was in Wisconsin um, right before the Teresa Halbach murder happened in 2005. 
Um, I was aware of Steve Avery as far as he was, when I left Wisconsin, this was the guy that was uh, making headlines because he had just gotten released from prison for, uh, for wait, losing 18 years of his life for the sexual assault that happened. So that's the Steve Avery I knew when I left Wisconsin and moved to Nebraska. I was in Nebraska when the, when the 2005, when the murder happened and I'm reading stories about, uh, you know, Stephen Avery's arrested, uh, you know, you know, there's all kinds of evidence, there's blood in the house, you know, and I didn't know anything about the case other than just the little snippets I was reading out in Nebraska at the time. Okay, so how much research went into this book? How many years did you spend on this book? I spent, uh, let's see, basically from December 2015 when the documentary came out to the um, summer of 17, I remained as a journalist uh, in Wisconsin. So, uh, and then the book came out in November of 18. So uh, that's what, uh, about two, uh, I, I'm, I'm going two to two and a half years of, uh, of time that I spent uh, putting the book together pretty much. Uh, I relied on some of my reporting, but a lot of the book is really kind of using my reporting to springboard and really do it, you know, it took my reporting to a different level, a more in-depth level that, uh, you know, again, you would never get out of a newspaper story per se. Absolutely. And did you go down to the courthouse and, uh, you know, go through the um, court uh, records there as well? And Yeah, I did. I did that a lot uh, when I was in Wisconsin. It was about an hour uh, drive every time because I was based in Appleton, Wisconsin, which was about, uh, yeah, again, about an hour's drive away from Mantua, from Mantua County. So, uh, I was always super careful that I never got caught speeding because I figured if the Mantua County Sheriff's Office ever caught me on the road, uh, who knows what would have happened to me, just because of the stories that I was already doing at that point in time that uh, that were pretty hard hitting, you know, and, and revelatory. Uh, I mean, I kind of had a, I had, I had a target on my back, you know, to begin with as a journalist there, which I was fine with, you know, because again, I just, I go where the, where the stories take me and I had no problem writing stories that were, um, um, taking a very, very critical, hard look at the at the Mantua County Sheriff's Office and you know their role in this uh, possible wrongful conviction. Did you have a right to Stephen or Brandon? I I did not with Stephen. I just because his case was still an appeal process. Um, but two things I could point out. Um, I I worked uh, closely. I through um, through his attorney Kathleen Zellner. So I did countless interviews. Uh, with Kathleen Zellner in person or over the phone. And, and then I also did, and she was very instrumental as far as uh, I interviewed her extensively as far as, you know, putting this book together um, and um, had access to Stephen Avery's family. So I, I went out to the Avery uh, salvage yard and met with his brothers, Earl and Chuck, and even, you know, mom and dad occasionally. Um, so I've been out to the Avery Salvage Yard numerous times. Uh, it's just for the logistics of the book. The book was going to be more about what were the other people doing behind the scenes and how they're trying to get Stephen free. And Stephen still worked into the book. I have some letters that he had written, uh, you know, that I was able to put in. But by and large, the book really needed to be told the way I was going, going with it, Kevin, through the people behind the scenes that are trying to be successful on his behalf. What was the uh, family's reaction to you when you met them? You know, I, I was fortunate, Kevin, from the standpoint that I did have one in. There was a there was a there was a guy named Jim that lived in Manitowoc uh, that uh, was a good close friend of the family ahead of time that had known me from some other stories that I had done on Manitowoc and Manitowoc County. So I went over, I think, the first time to the Avery Salvage Yard with with a guy named Jim, older gentleman. He's about 70, 71 years old or so, and. Um, and uh, so he showed me around and introduced me to the family. And just when I went out there with Jim, uh, I told, you know, the family, uh, um, you know, knew that uh, that I was I was out there just to just to, you know, get to the bottom of the truth. And I wasn't out to, uh, you know, screw them over or try to trick them or something like that. Right. Absolutely. Now, tell me about some of the uh, police uh, officers that you sort of traced from this case who have left the area and uh, aren't with that local, um, you know, police mm -hmm. establishment anymore. And what, what their take on the whole case was as well. Well, I did have uh, there was there was one uh, individual in particular that comes to mind, Kevin, that uh, had moved to uh, the state of Arizona. He had left the sheriff's office, uh, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, was a really good detective in that agency. And, uh, but he had worked there when there was a lot of shenanigans going on. So he kind of knew 
how some of the people that he worked with over there operated. And he knew that they weren't, um, you know, they regarded themselves sometimes as above the law, which means that they would cut corners or cheat or, uh, you know, engage in corruption if it meant covering up for somebody else in the department or, uh, or that sort of stuff. And, uh, and I was able to expose some of that in this book uh, um, because there was a key, a key case of a hit and run uh, fatality involving a young teenage boy that was, uh, that may have been run over by an off-duty Manitowoc County Sheriff's officer. And so the same people then that, that all of our listeners and viewers are familiar with in making a murderer, they were the same people that investigated this hit and run fatality of a teenage boy that the case basically immediately became a cold case from the get-go, and nobody really seemed to have a strong interest in trying to solve the case at the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office. Right, okay. Well, you know, there's so many people um, uh, doing sort of podcasts and uh, YouTube shows, you know, based on this, this case. Um, there's so many, well, I suppose you call them citizen journalists, maybe. Do you know what I mean? Do you think there's a bias sometimes w- with... Um, with some people in in this particular case, that it's difficult to look at it without you know uh, taking everything in, in, in because you know the, the, it's, it's so strong to show that maybe you know Stephen is um, not guilty, but then not much of the. If you met some other police officers that were involved in this case, they would say actually no, 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 Stephen is a hundred percent guilty of what happened. Right. Yeah, I would agree with you on that point, uh, especially you know. Um, Oftentimes, people um, you know, come up with their own opinion early on on a case, a high-profile case per se, and they're you know they stick to their guns and really aren't open-minded about you know learning new information. Um, and uh, and and I certainly think that that's true with some of the advocates in this case too, where where they're you know not necessarily open to uh, you know look at uh, step back and realize well maybe this you know maybe you know. Stephen could have done it, or maybe some of the evidence isn't necessarily all planted per se. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, I understand where they're coming from, but on the same token too, you, I wasn't there the night that this crime happened, October, you know, of 30, 31st of 2005. I, I couldn't say, you know, with 100% certainty that Stephen Avery, Stephen Avery, you know, is, is, is innocent, you know, and I, and I certainly, uh, you know, wouldn't say based on what I know, that he's 100% guilty either, but, uh, but, um, but I do, I do believe that there's a lot of people out there that, that become crusaders or cheerleaders for a case. And it's also easy for them, too, to build, you know, um, a you know, snowball effect and have other people jump on their bandwagon because on a high profile case, it seems like that there's just a, there's a natural tendency for, you know, for people to want to absorb and just, you know, dissect and learn as much as they can about the case, especially if the person walks away from watching a, a television show, reading a book or watching a Netflix documentary, you know, and, and becomes convinced with the, with the, um, the angle of the, you know, documentary and the author or the, you know, or the television journalist, you know. Um, so, uh, so there's, there's that immediate, you know, effort to want to kind of dissect more information, but then also there's other people that can, you know, take advantage of that, you know, or, or either build their own brand or maybe they just, Really strongly about their opinion, and uh, and then other people flock to them, you know, because they share the same like-minded, uh, you know, sentiment on the case. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, um, and I would totally understand that as well. Uh, I think that happens a, a lot with the with different cases, especially a case like this. But what is your take on it then? Do you think that Stephen and Brandon and Dassey are guilty of their crimes or not? I would say probably not. And the reason why, again, some of this will go back to my other journalism experience and the other books I've written about. The fact is that, that I, you know, like I said, 20, 25 years I have in the industry as far as covering true crime. And it's, it's very rare that you would have a set of a a homicide, a murder happen under the circumstances that both of them got convicted of. And again, let me backtrack and kind of explain that. You know, Teresa Halbach, 25 years old, goes out to, Avery Salvage Yard to do a photo shoot that day. She had been there several times before, had no problems going out there, wasn't fearful at all. If you if you buy the police and prosecution's theory, you would have Stephen Avery setting this crime up where it's premeditated that he lures her into his uh, trailer, starts raping her and attacking her, and then several minutes into this crime, Kevin, he's going to get a knock on his door 
and that it's supposedly his nephew Brendan, who just got home from school, you know, who finds an you know piece of mail in the uh, you know in his mailbox and needs to go to his uncle. Here's some screaming, and then Steve's going to stop what he's doing and invite his nephew Brendan to participate in the crime. That just those that set of circumstances never happens. I've never seen or read about a gang rape. That, that happens where it's a premeditated crime by one person, and then they get interrupted several minutes later, you know, to invite a family member in to participate. So that's the reason why that I don't really believe or buy the theory that, uh, that the two of them committed the crime under the circumstances that they were both convicted of. Not saying again, 100% sure that Stephen Avery is innocent, but, uh, but I don't see it happening in the way that both of them were convicted that this was a, um, you know, um, a double, you know, a, a co-conspirator type of rape slash murder, especially when there's no physical evidence. Then after the fact, then Kevin, that's found at the location that uh, that was, you know, where this crime supposedly happened. I'm going to go back and forth with, uh, you know, points against and and, and for, um, you know, uh, Stephen and, and Dassey. But obviously, uh, Dassey's uh, confession fits perfectly with the sort of forensic evidence as well, in some respects. I mean, how did he know what happened if he wasn't there? Oh, I, as, as far as, uh, well, by that point in time, too, several family members had already been, by the time he gets interviewed to Kevin, several family members had already at least, you know, had talked amongst themselves. There had been considerable television coverage, you know, news media coverage of the case. And the other point too, is that the way the interview was structured with him by the two police detectives, a lot of the questions that they're asking um, were done in a way that they were were, um, leading and coercive, I would say. And again, I'm just basing that based on my own experience that happened in my first case that I wrote a book about, uh, the Bloody Lies book. Uh, it was a false confession because the police basically told the individual who had had some, you know, mild, uh, um, you know, mental health issues as far as his IQ was around 70. But basically, the person starts telling a story or repeating, I should say, what the police believed had really happened. And it really, if you study the Brendan Dassey interviews, there's there's a lot of information that that he gets fed or he basically realizes if I repeat this to the cops that's what they're looking for you know and he's not thinking that if he says this stuff he's going to wind up in jail or prison the rest of his life he's thinking he's going to get to go back to seventh period you know at uh Chicago high school so or two rivers high school wherever he was at yeah yeah no I mean that was I mean yeah a forced confession i mean yeah it's uh i watched that as well many times and you know i've watched the docu series you know quite a few times as well and it's it's, it's fascinating and to, to see that uh take place and and that's not the, the first one of its type of that if that is what happened um but then um there's the, the, the some of the evidence you know in in a, a sort of you know not, i would say not discussed in making a murder was that, for example you know uh, Teresa, when she met uh, Avery, was kind of creeped out a bit when uh, he was just wearing a towel when she knocked on the door. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that story is true. Um, I, that's kind of a second or third hand type of story. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was true. But just, uh, I mean, Stephen was, you know, kind of an odd, I mean, odd guy to begin with, too. So, I mean, uh, he, uh, he had been involved in, you know, you know, types of different crimes, uh, nothing really violent. You know, if you throw out his sexual assault conviction that was committed by, you know, a guy named, an inmate named Gregory Allen. So, but he had, you know, he had been involved in, you know, thefts and, uh, you know, burglaries and, uh, you know, and drinking types of, uh, you know, incidents when he was in his, you know, teens and twenties. So, uh, I mean, by no stretch of imagination was he a, was he a perfect guy and, uh, and he wouldn't be, you know, he would certainly be the type that might, uh, you know, offend a woman or somebody creep him out uh, just based on his, uh, you know, his uh, his background. And then when he contacted Teresa, he uh, dialed uh, star 67 twice um, to, you know, sort of withhold his details from her because I think she had already made it clear to some of her colleagues as well that, that she did not like this man. And that, you know, she didn't really want to go back down to, uh, you know, take these pictures. She was, she was taking pictures of one of the cars that he was, uh, you know, trying to sell through her company, which it was uh, the, uh, well, her company. She worked for the auto trader locally. Auto trader, right. Yeah. Right. And um, so so why did he withhold his number to her then, do you think? You know, that's 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 a good question, Kevin. Um, I just don't know if, if he was, uh, if he was, you know, 
fearful that uh, that you know just by by giving her a number, she'd you know look and be like, oh God, you know, is it that guy again, or is it uh, you know, do I need to go back there? But uh, and I've heard other people say that that he really didn't mean to dial star sixty seven on that. Then um, it's uh, I mean, the, there's certainly those types of questions do if you know if you're the strong opinion that uh, that's a premeditated type, type type of crime and that Stevens the one that did it. Those would be certainly the types of things that would play into a you know um, um, a strong you know, a mindset as far as a premeditated premeditated type of crime. Kept. Okay, and then obviously there's the uh, you know Holbrook's uh, phone camera handbag on um, Avery's property as well. They found um, mm -hmm. with the uh, with with the camera equipment. Then I, again, that's one that uh, I mean, if she was clearly killed on the property, it would make sense that you would find uh, um, her material uh, clothing too, for example, as well. And camera equipment uh, would be found, uh, you know, on the uh, on the uh, on the property. The question that really, you know, sticks out to me though is whether or not she was killed, you know, on the on the Avery, you know, property, or whether the more likely scenario is that she was, she, you know, she met her demise, you know, about a quarter to a half mile away at the Quarry properties that are far behind where the Averys live, um, and that's where a lot of the bones, you know, were uh, were ultimately discovered. And we'll get to the bones in just a moment as well, um, but. Uh... On the night of the crime, I believe as well that his mother saw bleach on his jeans as well, um, mm -hmm. and I don't think he had any yeah, sort of alibi. Uh, um, it could have been, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was with with Brendan, and I know that's one one of the items that the you know the police department spent a lot of time trying to trying to find uh, um, you know um, you know bleach and other other material that would bolster their belief that that you know that they were trying to clean their their clothes or or that Brendan was trying to clean his clothes uh, you know after the crime um and uh, certainly uh you know the bleach possibility uh you know would certainly uh you know fall into that uh you know fall into that evidence did you do any research in the sense that um there was uh, rumors that um you know uh, uh Stephen had um, spoken to uh, other fellow inmates about uh, raping, torturing, and killing women, um, you know, and, and burning their bodies to get rid of them as well. Um, did you investigate yeah. that? Yeah, I did a lot of research on that. There was one individual in particular, um, there was one inmate uh, that um, he was, he seemed to be the one inmate that uh, he was out of Marinette County. Evans was his name. I think it was Joe Evans, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, he was, in fact, he wrote me a few times too, and he had he had sent letters to a lot of news media outlets. Um, I'm strongly of the opinion that that's all, you know, BS. That uh, that this was an inmate that was clearly um, out to make a name for himself slash try to get a better deal for himself. The way that some of his letters were typed. It basically was so outrageous, you know, that that you really couldn't take it seriously, regardless of whether or not you, you know, believe Stephen Avery was innocent or guilty. Even if you believed he was guilty, you would not really want to associate, you know, or bring this Joe Evans guy, you know, into the case after the fact and say, hey, look at these letters he's sending out now. Um, these things just really look, it almost looked like somebody gave him a copy of, uh, you know, of the court documents, or he got them on his own and, uh, you know, was just really out to make a name for himself. But I, he did this on two separate occasions over a several year period where it was just, um, it, yeah, it just, it just was a reminder that there's people out there that are con artists, you know, and, uh, and that they're in the prison system, you got to be careful. And that's probably why, so, yeah, people in prison that, that are good, reliable you know, witnesses in a crime after the fact. So now, um, in Avery and Dassett's homes, um, there were bags of irons. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry if I've got this wrong. I mean, you know, this is such a, so much to you know, sort of research on this case, but, um, mm -hmm. and just to do in one day, but is, is that before I leave the, ask this question, was there bags of irons that, 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 or that was found in Avery and Dassett's homes? Bags of irons. Um, or irons in Avery's and Dad. The, it, but, but Avery allegedly brought them before um, before the crime, and they matched uh, sort of Das's description of how um, Teresa Holbrook was sort of you know tied up. 
I mean, there was there was an issue about uh, you know handcuffs that were found, uh, you know that uh, that Stephen had, you know. Yeah, um, I mean, and that 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 came up by they were confiscated by the police, and uh, you know, and uh, that was a key point when the case went to trial. Kevin is, uh, you know, the prosecutor Ken Kratz had alleged that that Stephen had tied up uh, Teresa Hallbeck to his bedpost and was assaulting her, you know. Um, you know, you know, at the bed. But uh, the strange thing about that is that these handcuffs, so uh, um, didn't have any DNA evidence on them. That uh, that certainly uh, bolstered that uh, belief. And uh, and Stephen had maintained that he and one of his girlfriends had bought those, uh, you know, at a at a local uh, you know sex shop, uh, just uh, you know as uh, you know as toys, you know, for their rendezvous. So, well. What about the uh, the sort of bullet, um, um, the DNA matched Avery's rifle that was um, sort of, you know, uh, had um, Teresa's DNA on the bullet that was um, belonged to uh, Avery? Yeah, that's certainly, uh, again, um, depending on, 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 your, on your theory of the case, I mean, it would certainly solidify or bolster, you know, your belief that, uh, that this was the bullet that was used to, uh, to shoot her and kill her. Other people believe that that thing was all, you know, manufactured after the fact because that bullet wasn't found during the first search uh, of the of the garage when it happened back in November of 2005. It wasn't until the case was four or five months old that Stephen Avery was already sitting in jail that the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office goes back into the garage again. And then this time, the second time around, they claim that they located a couple bullets, uh, bullet fragments that they somehow missed the previous time, Kevin, and then it's those fragments then that get sent into the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, you know, and lo and behold, then, uh, you know, there's uh, there's DNA evidence that uh, that ties it to uh, Teresa, Teresa Hallbeck. But there was a tooth found, wasn't there, in the burn barrel? Isn't that right? There was Teresa Holt's um, tooth in, in Avery's fire pit, sorry. It was in Avery's fire, fire pit. pit. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say a fire pit. Right, right, right. Yeah, and... Um, Let's see. There's always, uh, I mean, that's a head scratcher that it, again either, either proves that uh, that she must have been burned out there, or the other question is where are all the are all the other teeth, and why would why would only you know a portion of a tooth be found there and not you know the rest of her full mouth of, of teeth? So uh, um, people always point out to me they're like, there's always like the one you know one fragment, one bullet fragment, uh, you know the the you know the one the car keys even that were found in Stephen Avery's bedroom you know, weren't her real car keys. That was just a spare key. You know, her real car keys weren't, were never found to this day. And neither was really her purse, you know, or, you know, whatever her identification cards, that kind of stuff, never been found to this day, which again, leads one to think that maybe there's a different burial site or, or whoever is the killer, you know, did a good job of hiding a lot of, uh, or concealing a lot of the real, real evidence about her and the crime. So what bones were recovered then? <laughs> and where were they recovered? Oh, sorry. Um, well, you did have um, you did have from the burn barrel, um, and again, that's another. Uh, um, you had from Bobby Dassey's burn barrel, which again is you know Stephen's nephew, uh, Brendan's brother, that lived right next door to him. You did have uh, some bones that were found in that barrel. You did have Teresa's uh, what was it her leg or shin bone? That was the one that they you know believe was was found at Stephen's uh, in his burn pile pit. And then again, later on in the case, uh, um, you had these other bone fragments that were found out at the uh, at the quarry that included the pelvic bone. And uh, and again, Kathleen Zellner and a lot of other people strongly believe that a lot of the bones that were found there, you know, everything ties together and that that was the key location where the dismantling of the body, of Teresa's body, likely could have taken place. Um, so there's three theories as far as where the dismantling takes place. One is just throwing her body into Stephen's burn pit on Halloween night after she died, um, you know, earlier that day in the middle of the afternoon. The other theory is that she was sawed, you know, or hacksawed to, you know, after she was dead inside Bobby Dassey's garage by Bobby and Scott Tadich, perhaps, or that they were involved in dismantling of the body out at that uh, quarry that's, again, about a half mile, quarter mile behind where they all live out there, the Avery's. So. 
Yes, because uh, Scott, which is um, Brendan Das's uh, brother, he had um, experience in um, dismantling uh, carcasses because he was a, a sort of seasoned hunter, weren't he? Uh, Brendan wasn't really into hunting, was he, compared to his brother? That's right. That's right. Uh, Bobby, uh, his uh, his older brother, uh, um, was uh, w- was really into hunting, and uh, you know had his own uh, um, you know um, rifle, and uh, would do a lot of uh, deer hunting along with us with Scott Tadich. Scott was kind of like their stepdad, um, and uh, wasn't their real biological dad, if I remember right. Um, so, he, but he was there a lot. Uh, but yeah, you're right about Brendan. Brendan really was not into into hunting, and again. As people have told me that they were on this case, including, you know, the, um, you know, one of the investigators that helped uh, on the defense uh, for Dean Strang and uh, Jerry Buting, but has since passed away in the last year or so, Pete Bates, who was in the making a murder. But, uh, but Pete had always told me, and he was a retired Illinois state policeman, he was always the opinion that, that whoever was involved in this crime um, had to have experience with, uh, you know, with, um, with animals because he said just dismantling a body like this is just such a messy, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of gory, you know, thing to do. And it would really take somebody that really knows how to do that firsthand, has experience with this because, as, as Pete had told me, he's like, just dismantling a body like that, John. He's like, it's, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, especially if, if you are of the opinion that Stephen Avery also wasn't much of a hunter himself and that certainly Brandon was so. Do you think it's possible then, John, that the, you know, Bobby and Scott could be involved in the murder along with um, uh, Brandon and uh, Stephen and that they helped dispose of the body for these two, um, you know, because they, you know, were, were just blood is thick in the water in a sense with family. And um, I mean, has that ever crossed your mind? That That's a that's a good question. I don't think I've ever been asked the question that way as far as the overlapping of family members. I've had it, I've had, I've, I've been asked the question of like, well, Scott and Bobby teaming up or, you know, Brendan and, you know, and Stephen and maybe Earl and Chuck, you know, that the two families kind of, but I've never had a question like kind of bringing them all together. And I would say, I mean, yeah, I would say that's definitely possible um, considering the close family ties, you know, and, and like you said, the overlap, but, uh, it's uh, could could two have been involved and then two other helped? Absolutely. Uh, the reason why that part of me though um, just kind of dismisses that is because uh, once you get into conspiracies, it's it's really gets hard to kind of get too many people involved before people start ratting each other out and stuff. And in this case, it's always kind of been the opposite. Um, you know, Bobby and you know Scott have never really done anything to even help Brendan who's their own brother and, you know, and, and, you know, stepson to try to get out of this mess. And I would think it's more likely that, that if, if they think Brendan's innocent, then they could think Stephen's guilty, but they should be fighting to help get Brendan, uh, you know, released from, uh, from custody. No, right. Okay. Yeah. But as you say, there's been no sort of uh, love between the family to want to help each other there. I wonder what the relationship mm-hmm. is in keeping in contact with each other, if they have kept in contact with each other or whether that's, um, not been the case. It's it's pretty strained, and I do get into a little bit of that uh, in the in the wrecking crew, just because there were some taped phone conversations. Actually, it was kind of interesting. Uh, there was a little bit of eavesdropping. So Scott Tadich, well, just to remind everybody, so so Stephen Avery has one sister. Um, he has the two brothers that run the salvage yard, Earl and Chuck, but he has one sister, and that's Barb. And Barb is the mother then of Brendan Dassey, Bobby Dassey. And uh, and there were uh, two other boys as well, and uh, and then she's married to Scott Tadich. During one of the phone conversations between Steve and uh, and his sister Barb a couple years ago, Scott Tadich was eavesdropping and listening in on the calls, and he just becomes ballistic and starts screaming and you know cussing out Avery, you know, saying it's like you're you're dead, you you I'm after, you know, I can't wait to get my hands on you, and uh, and then and then. You know, Avery's kind of telling his sister, you know, look at this guy. You know, he's he's explosive. No wonder why my lawyer's looking at him as, you know, as, you know, possibly being a accomplice, you know, in the murder and stuff. So uh, um, so it's yeah, it's interesting. But, yeah, I mean, Scott Tadich definitely has a temper. I would not see I don't I I'm of the opinion, though. That if somebody other than Steve Avery was involved in the crime, though, it would not be Scott Tadich by himself. He may have helped out 
like disposing of a body or helping conceal a crime, but I don't see, you know, I don't see Scott Tadich of, uh, you know, being the, you know, the other perpetrator if it was somebody other than Steve Avery. What did they find on Brendan Das's brother's uh, computer, Bobby, when they um, searched well, his computer? Well, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, you know, disturbing, uh, you know, um, violent child pornography, uh, you know, pornography involving, uh, um, I'm trying to remember, so, what, animals and stuff like that. So it was, uh, um, that kind of fed into the, the theory and the belief of, uh, of, you know, Avery's lawyer, Kathleen Zellner, that, uh, you know, that, that Bobby was consumed by a lot of this, uh, you know, this, you know, this violent, hardcore, you know, pornography and the, the, that drove him, you know, over the edge as far as that he became obsessed and fascinated with, uh, with, um, with Teresa Halbeck and that, you know, that he may have hunted her down, you know, and uh, stalked her and that he would be, you know, responsible for killing her off site again, if the crime happened the way that Zellner believes it did. And that's what she's going down right now um, with, with um, uh, Stephen Avery's lawyer, um, Catherine, um, where does she stand right now with, with his case? Where, where are they at with the case? It's kind of been moving at a slow pace for the last uh, you know year or two. Um, it's uh, it's at the court of appeals in the state of Wisconsin, so it's not at a federal um, you know um, judiciary. Which I think you know if Avery was in a federal system, he'd have a much better chance of getting a new trial a lot quicker. Um, Zellner's hope right now is to get the case sent back to. Uh, um, Manitowoc County or, or maybe Sheboygan County just because of, you know, jurisdiction, but, uh, but to see, get it sent back for an evidentiary hearing. And uh, she was unable to get the local judge, uh, um, Angie Suckowitz to, uh, you know, agree to that uh, for whatever reason, you know, it, it didn't happen. So now Zellner's at the Court of Appeals and they've been filing, you know, hundreds of pages of briefs, her and the state of Wisconsin, you know, pointing out their reasons, their arguments of why, you know, the first trial, you know, um, was was legitimate, Stephen Avery should be in prison, or from Zellner's standpoint, that there was a lot of, you know, Brady violations, which means, you know, that the prosecution cheated or, you know, or, you know, abused its authority and power, but basically that Stephen Avery should get a new, you know, a new trial. And uh, we're kind of waiting for the Court of Appeals to issue a ruling. Um, and how's that being funded for Stephen? Is she doing that on a on a sort of free basis, um, just just to do with you know with the publicity of the case? I think yeah, pretty much that's the case. Yeah, she's uh, yeah, she's. I mean, there's been times I think where she's accepted donations, but she's not really going out of her way to uh, um, you know m- you know milk the public or milk the trough, you know, for uh, for donations. She's pretty much that problem. Yeah, so her firm's obviously dealing with many other cases, but this is one of the correct main cases that 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 she's um, you know felt drawn to um, want to do. But has she ever has she ever had clients in the past that she got out and she felt that in the end, many in years to come, that actually they did do the crime and she got them out and she was regretful for that. Well, the first case I think that that she really took that uh, when she was testing the waters as a younger attorney. She took, uh, um, and she was, she was doing some public defender work, Kevin, at that point in time. And there was a guy that, uh, that she was asked to help out on his case. I think he was at that point, his name was Larry Eiler. He since died, but he was uh, facing the death penalty in Illinois and he'd been involved in several. He was, um, he was convicted. uh, He had me, he was linked to be a serial killer, but he, I think he had only been, proven to, you know, have murdered, you know, he had only been convicted of, I think, one murder at that point in time. She did, she was asked to take the case on to try to find evidence to overturn his conviction at, uh, you know, a, in the case. And through her interviews of, 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 of Eiler and her own research into the case, she became convinced that, that he was, in fact, a serial killer. And then, and then through her efforts, she was able to ultimately help the police you know, solve and, cr- and close a lot of these other cases that Larry Eiler had been suspected of committing, but had never been charged with committing. And it was because of that case she had an epiphany, Kevin, that she decided she's not going to be the type of defense lawyer that's going to help, quote, get the guilty people off on a technicality. And that if she ever is going to take a case for somebody that uh, that claims that they're innocent, even though they've been sent away to prison or on death row for a murder, 
that they claim that they didn't commit, she's going to make damn sure that she's sure that uh, they're not full of her later in life, you know, in her career. Okay, okay. And with uh, Teresa's boyfriend at the time, was there much research that you did into him? Because he seemed on the docu-series to be very, um, well, he didn't want to, um, you know, uh, to come forward again, did he much, to, to help out with the case as time went on? Right. In fact, I, I remember I try I called him one time when I still worked in Wisconsin. So long, long before I was, you know, really super deep into the book, but I tried to interview him. Um, Ryan, that is Ryan Hillegas. And, uh, and uh, he was really, uh, it was kind of an odd conversation. But basically, yeah, the long and short of it was that he did not, uh, you know, did want, not want to be in, in, interviewed, even, you know, even if it was just going to be a story about talking about, uh, you know, how the documentary portrayed him, you know, that kind of stuff. He really, you know, was trying to move on or stay out of the public limelight at that point in time. But um, no, you're right. I mean, I did spend some time researching him as a, you know, as a journalist and certainly as putting the book together. Um, I, even though a lot of crimes are committed by a, you know, domestic abuser or somebody that's involved in a relationship, I really didn't find any strong hard evidence that really could, you know, pinpoint a time and a, and a, and a you know, and a, and a motive, you know, uh, looking at Ryan Hilgis. Uh, I know some people out there certainly that believe in Steve Avery's innocence, you know, are convinced that he would be the prime suspect or he'd be the most likely one because of, like you just said, Kevin, that he was evasive at times. He seemed to kind of be, you know, one step ahead of the cops. Oftentimes, uh, he seemed to kind of want to work himself into the investigation where, you know, it's not just the police doing the investigation, but Ryan Hilgis is kind of helping, you know, coordinate things, which then also gives him an in as far as what the police are up to. You know, those are, I mean, those are things that kind of, you know, are a little fishy, you know, looking back at him. But, um, but I just never really, I never really got to the point where he seemed to be like the obvious person that, that, that would have done the crime if Stephen Avery didn't. Okay. Now, um, thank you for that. And uh, Ken uh, Kratz, the, um, the former lawyer and district attorney uh, for Wisconsin, uh, who was um, part of the original uh, um, uh, trial, what did you do with him in the sense of research, in the sense of contacting him? Was there any contribution from him? Um, I'm trying to remember with the book. I don't think uh, I really reached out to him. I had interviewed him on different occasions when I was a reporter in Wisconsin, but uh, a lot of the the material that I utilized for the book uh, um, was uh, material that uh, that really dealt with um, his um, disciplinary uh, um, hearing in was I'm sorry in Wisconsin dealing with the, a lot of the allegations uh, and, and the other thing too is I think Kevin Ken Kratz oftentimes is a is a liar so I wasn't I really didn't want to have him come back and tell me that uh, um, um, he already had a chance to refute a lot of this information um, but it led to his suspension you know from Wisconsin and and, and I wanted to kind of let people know here's some of the cases that uh, that he was involved with at the same time or you know prior to um, the prosecution of, of Teresa Holbeck. So um, the thing, I, thing about Kratz is that uh, unlike a lot of attorneys that I've, I've worked with over the years, I mean, he just seemed like he just goes out of his way to be, you know, to be a showboat. And, uh, and I, prosecutors for the most part that I've always dealt with are just kind of like, they do their job, you know, if, if they get a, their job is to get a conviction, but not let the case and, you know, you know, propel their career or, you know, even turn it into a book as prosecutors is considered, you know, somewhat unethical by a lot of lawyers. But, uh, um, but I just, I mean, the fact is the guy twists the facts a lot of times. And uh, and trust me, I've dealt with a lot of prosecutors and 95% of them are very reputable and noble and have been portrayed, you know, in a high regard in a lot of my other books. But uh, but Kratz just, uh, um, is, he's just an odd duck and a really strange, uh, strange guy. And uh, I think this case would have been, um, justice would have been better served if a different prosecutor had convicted Stephen Avery because, yeah, Kratz just doesn't carry a lot of credibility and, uh, you know, and the versions that he came up with at trial may not be the real facts of the crime, even if Stephen Avery did commit the crime. Right, okay. And obviously, you know, we've, we're have sort of going over here just, you know, whether innocent people here have been framed for this uh, murder. And... Um, What's your uh, take on, you know, planted evidence and, and why do you think if, if you have gone down that road, that would even be a reality? 
Well, I would say, uh, I mean, one thing, is, first of all, is I do have experience uh, with, with the plant evidence stuff. I, my, my first book, I did uh, the Bloody Lies one in, um, about six, seven years ago, but uh, it was about a CSI that I knew really well in Wisconsin, I'm sorry, in Nebraska. Um, and uh, and uh, he ultimately went to prison because he was planting evidence in, in, a, in, a, in several murder cases, and uh, he had gotten away with it. In, in different cases until everything kind of snowballed. So I kind of know what to look for as far as if you're going to plant evidence, here's how you could do it and get away with it. Um, and also how you can, get, you know, then how it could you know, come back against you after the fact. The thing about the Avery case is that there's just so many, oftentimes in the evidence planning cases, Kevin, you have a pattern of the police going back to the same location to search it again and again and again. And it's like the third or fourth time is when they quote, find the evidence. Um, so if you're really doing the job, a good job the first couple of times around, you're usually not gonna even need to go back because it's gonna be like, well, we searched that bedroom. We searched that garage, you know, why, is, why, are we, why, would, so, why would something be there five months later, you know, um, you know, if it wasn't there the first time. And again, especially when we're talking about Stephen Avery's bedroom, the, the bedroom, and I've been to that, you know, trailer several times, you know, the thing's about as big as a shoebox. Um, so it's really small. And uh, and to have three or four police officers search in that bedroom like they did, you know, for four or five hours on the first night of the case, several days before Stephen's ultimately arrested, but they don't find any evidence in there, you know, and they certainly uh, um, don't find any, any, um, any keys. And it's not until the third or fourth time that they're kind of really, you know, zeroed in on trying to make the arrest of Stephen Avery that you have all these strange pieces of evidence kind of all falling together several days after the fact. And, and in my opinion, Kevin, the strangest pieces of evidence are, yeah, that little key, the, the spare key that gets found on the bedroom carpet, you know, on Tuesday, November 8th of 2005, which would have been like the fourth or the fifth day of the investigation. That Teresa has been missing. You have this license plate, this crumbled up license plate from her vehicle that gets found um, on the same that same day as well. But the police had already done a huge, massive search of that whole salvage yard two days earlier, and you know didn't find it then at that point in time. And uh, I was just going to say, and and again, it's one of the situations that. It's odd that if you would have thought that they, if, if you would have been, a, if, if I would have led that search and you would have been working for me that day, and, and let's just say we, we did, we got 80, you would have came back and said, hey, John, we got 80% of the, lar- the, the salvage yard done, but we, we still are missing 20%. It would have made more sense that you go back the very next day. But what's, what's odd about that is that they search the yard on Sunday, don't find anything. They don't do the follow-up search the next day. They wait till Tuesday. And then Tuesday is going to, again, be the same day that they're going to also go back and find the spare key. They're going to find that license plate that's all bent up. And that's also the day that they find the bone or the bones out at the uh, the cell at the little burn pit, uh, which again, they've been out there four or five days. I'm not saying that there weren't bones at the burn pit, but that's one of the head scratchers that with so many police out there, you know, you know, you know, over so many days, it just, it's really hard. And I've walked that area. It just, it's hard to believe that, you know, they all missed it. You know, maybe they did, but just when you add up all these things all being found, like on the fifth day of the case, it tells me that they were under, they felt under pressure, you know, from their superiors that, Hey, this is the, the you know, this is the bastard we believe committed this crime. Um, we need to find the evidence to, you know, to, to nail him. And we can't, we're, we're running out of time. We can't have this property for the next six years, you know. So you're saying that maybe the um, the burned bones were moved from the quarry over to the burn pit um, to frame Stephen and um, obviously uh, Brendan in the end. Um, Correct. And uh, But it, it, nothing was actually done there. There was no crime committed there um, at, at, that, at that location. And uh, there was no bodily fluids found in uh, Avery's home, was there, that belonged to Teresa or, or, um, or anyone else? Uh, and, uh, you know, semen or anything like that, no? Right. That's correct. Yeah, that's, uh, that's you know, that's, again, why people have asked me over the years, and I've said, hey, I'm not 100% convinced that Stephen Avery is innocent, but I believe that if Stephen Avery did commit the crime, that it probably happened under different circumstances that he was arrested and convicted of. For example, I'll just tell you this, for ex- you know, right next to his property, there's this little cellar, okay? I mean, it's, it's like a cellar you'd go for to avoid a tornado. And it always, you know, 
it's, it's, it's literally, you're not that, not that far from the burn pit, you know, it's, but I, I just, I remember when I went out there, I'm thinking to myself, you know, that would have made a much better circumstance as far as like Avery pushed her down into the little cellar or attacked her down there. You know, that would have made more logical sense to me if this was a premeditate, premeditate, premeditated type of crime than the facts that, uh, that they came up with to uh, get him convicted, uh, you know, um, you know, at his trial. Uh, uh, do do you think it's a bit far fetched though to say that the the police at that time would have gone to all that length when it wasn't their money being paid out from any uh, you know uh, government uh, funds in the sense that they they never owed the money if Stephen was going to get the big payout and and um, you know to give those orders from some wherever those orders would have been given from to you know to to bury him to make him look like he's done this uh, that's just something that that only happens in the movies that that's not reality. It, um, I would say that that's probably true. The, uh, but I would also, I would also point out too, in a small town like that, um, if Stephen, a, you're right, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been their money out of their own pocket per se, as far as like the sheriff and the detectives, what you know, because Sarah probably wouldn't have had to pay or you know mortgage his house or sell his house, uh, although it's a possibility. But the fact is, probably an insurance company would have paid out the firm or paid out the money. But the fact is. Those people also did not want to see Stephen Avery become a multimillionaire, you know, and then living amongst them too. So that would have irritated them. And just the fact that he would have won up them, you know, as far as, you know, they, just in the realm of public opinion, they would have looked like the biggest fools in the world because it would have also, they were, some of them were still going around telling people that he, he was, that he didn't, that he still committed the rape, even though every the DNA evidence proved he was innocent, and Gregory Allen committed that crime. So there was a lot of this was just you know trying to save face too, Kevin. Yep, and uh, again, as you said at the beginning of this conversation, none of us were there. And sometimes um, things can happen, strange things can happen like this. That like he could have done this, and um, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, as you say, we'll we'll never know. It's all you know. It's ba- you know based on the evidence. You know, it has been shown that he did. But I mean, I mean, for this to be rigged, then obviously the jury would have had to been um, um, rigged as well, um, or no, or, 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 sure. mis- or misled. Should we say that misled? I would say yeah. yeah. Just because uh, um, I my experience with juries is is that. Uh, um, it's, it's, it would, I mean, and now I do know that there are some people that follow the Stephen Avery case that do believe that strongly that, that, that some of the jurors were, you know, put on there for a reason. And, uh, I, you know, maybe part of that's true, but I think by and large, it's more likely than that if, you know, that if, if Stephen Avery was innocent or is innocent, that the jury would have been misled. No different than some of my other cases that I've written about. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I you know, my, okay. Oh, and let's just look at the planted evidence. So we've got uh, Teresa's car was uh, planted on the Avery lot. Um, Avery's blood was planted in Teresa's car. Bullets were planted in Avery's garage. Teresa's keys were mm-hmm. planted in Avery's bedroom, and his DNA was planted on the keys. Uh, Teresa's bones were planted in the fire pit, and the hood latch swab was planted from Avery's groin swab. Mm-hmm. Right, right, the groin swabs. That's right. Yeah, I forgot about those. Yeah, but that's that's um, that's quite a, a big to do, isn't it? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right, and 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 and, and that's true. Um, but on the on the same token, too, if if you were gonna if you, if you had already gotten away with planting evidence, you know, on a case three times, why would you not do it four or five or six times? You know what I'm saying? So. Um, I'm just saying if, if there is evidence as planted, Kevin, I think it's more likely that there's five or six pieces of evidence planted in this case, rather than just one or two pieces of evidence planted, uh, you know, so, um, I think that, uh, you know, but again, there may be zero pieces of evidence planted. I mean, only, you know, only, you know, you know. Only God knows. Well, sure I mean, I mean, okay, just look at the the groin swab. You know, um, it, it is said that the nurse who took the groin swab, you know, threw it into a sharpie bin herself. It, you know, that, mm-hmm. that 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 is that right? That the groin swab uh, disappeared and that she threw it in away. The nurse did. Well, th- that's kind of disputed as far as a- I know. Avery, who watched this happen, disputed that, and you know, it was always the opinion that uh, that you know, again, the two officers that were there, one was Mark Weger and the other one was Tom Fassbender. And, you know, kind of as a timeout for everybody, 
this never even should have been happening because they already had Stephen Avery's DNA. You know, so so this whole peculiar event of even taking him to the hospital to be getting additional DNA from him to begin with is strange and peculiar. Even if you believe strongly that Stephen Avery is 100% guilty, you know, I'm totally fine. But uh, just for everybody that, that feels that way, it's just an odd set of circumstances as far as why are these two guys, of all people, you know, leading, you know, bringing, uh, you know, him there to the hospital to get additional DNA swabs, let alone taking him, you know, from the groin, you know, unless, again, if you're if you're the opinion that he, these ends are being framed, that would you know, b- you know make sense to you as far as as a believer that hey, why would these guys are doing this because they want to use his? They need they realize that there may come a time later in this case that they're going to need to harvest some additional evidence, um, you know, to help you know, and they may have believed he was a guilty guy. So it could have been people sometimes just think you know framing an innocent person. They could have felt that Stephen Avery was guilty and that maybe they had half the evidence they needed, but they wanted to make sure that they had super. Strong evidence. That's what my guy in Nebraska did. He thought he was framing guilty people. That's what he ultimately got screwed up because he he messed up in a false confession case. But he was thinking that he would just find that one or two extra pieces of evidence, Kevin, and that that's what was going to get the case over the hump, and it usually did. And then he got some glory out of it, and uh, you know, and took a lot of credit for it. So, uh, so sometimes if there is evidence planting, it's because the police really really feel strongly that they're frank, they're 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 just shoring up you know, a couple holes in a case, you know, against somebody that's really bad and really needs to be taken out, you know, out of society for the betterment of the public. Yes, yes, uh, agreed. And in regards to the bullets, right, that were recovered, now, were they recovered in the garage, Avery's garage? Correct. Yes, yeah, they were. Uh, they were, um, yeah, there was a couple fragments. Uh, there were, now, just to, to remind people, the Averys did a lot of target practice and shooting and also shot at varmints like squirrels, raccoons, beavers, all that kind of stuff out there. So there was already a lot of, you know, shells throughout that property because again, they were, you know, constantly shooting and so were other, you know, extended family members and friends as well. Out there, right. So. But they, they did find a bullet that, that um, um, was connected to the shooting potentially of Correct. Teresa. Yeah. Right. Correct. So, so the prosecution never claimed the bullet recovered that went through uh, went through Teresa's skull. Um, th- what they're saying is th- there was ten shell casings were recovered, and the prosecution believes she was shot multiple times. Uh, some mm-hmm. bullets not hitting her skull, so not finding um, b- uh, bone on the bullet basically doesn't discredit the, the prosecution neither, does it really? Probably not. No, I would say, yeah. I mean, that's, I, I'm not a technical expert as far as with the DNA, as far as just kind of, you know, when, as far as that a, a bullet fragment that would go through the skull. But um, I, I would just say for the sake of argument, uh, um, I mean, it, it's likely that that, uh, you know, would have had something to do with the, with the crime rather than, uh, you know, being a completely phony piece of evidence. There was a guy called uh, Robert Fabian, uh, a friend of, um, of Earl Avery, Avery um, one of uh, Stephen's <laughs> brothers. Avery. Yeah, and uh, he did state that he saw Stephen between 4.30 and uh, 5 p.m. on the 31st of October, freshly cleaned uh, with a change of clothing, acting very strangely and having a fire in the burn barrel where Teresa's electronics were found. Did you get a chance I to mean, speak to him? or? I didn't, Fabian, I did not. I remember I tried to him a couple times. I think there was some some people, it's kind of interesting with the making murder stuff, Kevin. Some people just came out of the woodwork and were really, you know, um, um, easy to find and, you know, and always available, for ex- very accessible for interviews. And then other people uh, just kind of went incognito and really didn't want any pub- publicity or, or, you know, wanted recognition. And Fabian, Fabian was one of them. So I never did get a chance to interview I know we've gone over our time here and, uh, we're, you know, um, we are at the end of this interview right now. And I know there's just so much that we haven't spoken about. I mean, this is such a big case. Do you know what I mean? There is so much to this. It would take me months and months to absorb it all. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, not just, you know, you know, rewatching the murder docuseries, but, you know, just the transcript, just all of this. There's so much. Do you, do you think that you would uh, continue to to sort of probe this case and, and keep moving forward as the case moves forward do you think this is it for you or there's more to this for you it depends uh kevin uh, i would i would say if, if if stephen avery's conviction gets overturned then i would say that there would probably be a good chance that i would want to uh you know continue on with it uh but uh as long as the case is kind of you know you know stuck 
I like the court of appeals and really not going anywhere, you know, for a while, then, uh, then, you know, then I'm kind of, you know, um, at the fork in the road. Uh, um, so it's just, uh, I, I just would, would hope that uh, we get a ruling sometime in the near future, sooner than later. I w- I'm kind of surprised that we're having this conversation now and we still don't have, you know, a verdict yet from the court of appeals on the case. Um, as far as whether or not he's going to get a new trial or not, I, I realize the system takes slow, you know, slow going. So I've you know, covered my share of cases. I know the federal system, especially, is slow too. But uh, I would have just thought, with all the filings already that have been done, that the court would have been moving a lot faster, and uh, you know, and uh, that we'd have some. Well, I suppose there's corona in there as well, which has delayed a lot of the big cases as well in some respects, right, or, right, or given right, a, a, right, a chance right. to slow things down to to make sure they're going to come up with the right decision. But um, yeah, and I, and I, and I suppose I've I've heard as well that Ken Kratz has got his own uh, docu series coming out soon. I don't know if that's true or not, or there is an opposing docu series coming out on the making. Yeah, I think there that. is. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. I'll be curious to see what that you know you know, what's aired in that then. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, again, uh, um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of interest in this case and, uh, and it certainly hasn't waned in the last couple of years, even though it's been a few years since the making murder originally it had come out, Kevin, that's for sure. With original court transcripts and documentation, is that something that you were, uh, that you have and you've, you've got a lot of that stuff or. Yeah, I, I do have a lot of it. Uh, I was going to say, um, um, a lot of it, uh, I was going to say, thank, thankfully, it's uh, I, I have it on, uh, you know, computer or thumb drive because, uh, yeah, it would take up my whole basement. <laughs> it's, I had it all in just paper, paper forms. So there was a time as well as a reporter, I would go to Matwak and, you know, get the hard copies of, uh, you know, the binders where the books, you know, were like, uh, as far as just the Zellner filings and stuff like that. I remember one was like 1,600 pages. Uh, and she did like one of her first filings on the case. And uh, I think it was yeah May or June of 2016. Uh, we were all, uh, you know, hot to trot and at the courthouse for her first uh, first court appearance over there. But uh, um, I know she would have felt, I know, I know she would have felt that this case, she would have expected that we would have had a verdict by now too. I mean, uh, I don't think, she, I know she knows the system takes a while, but uh, I think she's probably disappointed that it hasn't gone in her favor at this point in time. But uh you know, okay. it's out of control. Absolutely. Well, John, I just want to say thank you so, so much for coming on. Really appreciate you having you on. It's been really interesting. I hope I've done Excellent. my best here to sort of move this oh, forward. Oh, you've asked some yeah. great questions. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, 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 right. is, it is a, a very difficult case, and uh, it's definitely not uh, clear cut. Uh, but just thank you for bearing with me, and thank you for coming on. Thank you very much, then, Kevin. It was a, it was a great, a great conversation, and uh, certainly uh, feel free to have me on again in the future if you want to talk about it.